On November 13, 2015, Jalon J.J. Clavo was gunned down in Sacramento. Gun violence is among the key factors that make African-American child mortality disproportionately the highest in the Sacramento region. Leaders in our community have created a new initiative to address this crisis that is taking the lives of far too many innocent children. Joining me today to talk about this crisis and what we can do to solve it are Sierra Health Foundation CEO, Chet Hewitt, and the mother of J.J. Clavo, Dr. Nicole Clavo. They join us next on Studio Sacramento. At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. Dr. Clavo, tell us what happened to your son. Well, um, on November 13th, 2015, approximately 3.30, 3.45 that afternoon, my son and four other football teammates decided that they would go out and grab a quick bite to eat prior to making their team meeting for the first playoff game of the season. Uh, on their way back, traveling to the school, um, they pulled up to a three-way stop sign on Silver Eagle and Maple. And at that time they were at the stop sign, an individual came up to the car and shot into my son's car, which he was the driver, into the passenger side of the vehicle, shooting one of the passengers in the front seat and my son as well. And my son succumbed to his injuries, to the bullet wounds. And this crime, this tragedy, have your son's assailants been brought to justice? The shooter has. The other um, assailants that were in the vehicle at the time have not been arrested. No charges have been brought forth to date. Um, I'm not aware of who they are. I believe the officers may know, the detectives may know who they are, but at this time no charges have been filed against them. Chet, gun violence against young African Americans is a key component of African American youth mortality, but it's not the whole issue, surprisingly enough. Give us some perspective on what the problem is and its scope. You know, gun violence is uh, one of the four leading causes of disproportionate African American child death that takes place in the county of Sacramento. Uh, there's also child abuse and neglect uh, deaths. There is uh, uh, the concern around sleep-related um, deaths and in perinatal conditions as well as well as third-party homicides. So those four leading causes of death really drive the disproportionate numbers that we see as relates to African-American uh, children. Now violence, as you know, we know has know, come enormous ripple effects associated with it. Uh, if you listen uh, to Dr. Clavo's story, there was other men who were, young men who were exposed to that violent act who were in that uh, vehicle. There are people who on the street who, who saw that as well. So this, this notion of, you know, trauma and mortality uh, in those communities are clearly about those who are victimized by that, but also, you know, have effects on you know, those who, who live in those communities who are still with us as well. It's a broader issue than just the African-American population though, because violence ends up not being contained to a single neighborhood, mm -hmm. a, a single community. This initiative that ha is happening here in Sacramento is a broad scale initiative. Give us a, a sense of what it is that uh, folks like you and Dr. Clavo are trying to address? Mm -hmm. You know, we, we use this term uh, targeted but universal, and that is that we know where a lot of the disproportionality takes place. I just said earlier that we know the areas that have the most disproportionality as relates to child mortality. Uh, we know the six communities uh, here in Sacramento where 81% of those deaths in those four areas actually take place. 
And it's just 81 percent. 81 percent of deaths in those four categories take place in six communities as well. So our charge as we have thoughtfully gone about this particular work is to really engage a community uh, in those four neighborhoods and to have them not simply be the places that are known for the level of proportionality, but to use the resources and assets that are in those communities uh, to really address uh, the crisis. I think one of the things that many people would be surprised about, and I know we're talking about violence, is that more than half of those deaths that have taken place in those four categories, in those six communities, are actually sleep-related infant deaths as well. Sleep-related infant deaths? Wow. Sleep-related infant, wow. sleep really? infant deaths, yes. Wow. And so these are all preventable causes of death, but this is going to require changes in approach. It's going to re require changes in kind of the policy framework under which these issues uh, are responded to. Um, and it's going to require, uh, you know, ownership on a part of the community, engagement on a part of the community, because these are not issues that, you know, systems, regardless of how well or their meaning they may be or intent they may be, uh, can really address uh, themselves. Well, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about not only systems, but, but perceptions. Mm -hmm. And uh, perception would be, uh, okay, black kid, grand high school, low income area, and what typically happens in situations like this is that there's a rush to judgment in terms of, oh, well, this must have been going on, or this uh, there must have been an involvement and in, you take the ism, drugs, gangs, whatever, whatever else it is. Share with us, who was your son? Well, Scott, I mean, he was your typical 17 year old. Um, money, car, girls, <laughs> clothes, and you know, very vain and into his looks. But he was also, you know, my baby. You know, I have two kids, and he was my, my spoiled brat. Um, mama's boy, you know, really an emotional kid, tough guy, tough exterior, marshmallow inside. Um, and football is what he loved to do. It's, you know, he took great joy and pride in, in his sportsmanship and just enjoying life, you know, just enjoying life and, you know, being that normal, headache of a child at 17 you know not a perfect kid but what little boy or girl at 17 is you know that's their job to give us a couple of headaches um but overall you know he was spirited you know he always had a smile on his face he was all fu always full of joy and laughter the jokester and you know he was my baby uh, I, I ask you to share that because we can talk a lot about statistics mm -hmm. but but these are our, our babies. These are boys and girls and nieces and nephews. And Chet, how do we get to the point where it is that we as a community and as systems start to address the sorts of problems that lead to tragedies like uh, JJ's or the, the other indices that you point out in a way that's holistic. You know, I think one of the things that this entire community can be most proud of is the fact that we're going to actually have a conversation about these particular issues. And that we're going to challenge some of our assumptions about who the victims uh, of these mortalities actually are. Mm -hmm. You know, you alluded to this earlier. Uh, you know, you said, tell, uh, say who your son is to Dr. Clavo. And, you know, with all the ways that you actually describe him, he's not, he's not, a, he's not a gang involved you know, young man who has, you know, somehow uh, positioned himself for a greater likelihood that something unfortunate would actually happen to him. Mm -hmm. and I think that's true about, uh, you know, most, if not all, of the children across these four indices of mortality uh, that we're look that we're looking at. Um, and I think that Sacramentans uh, across the board can can really take pride. And I, I say that because you know we've been involved in national conversations that's been born out of this work. Uh, we've testified um, uh, personally in front of you know federal commissions who have asked us about you know how did we um, how did we support a community in getting to this place where you can have a more open and honest conversation well, about this. Well, it's interesting that the champion at the governmental level mm -hmm. is 
who was a Latino supervisor, Phil Cerna, yeah. Phil Cerna yeah. at the time, who I know wrote op-eds mm -hmm. on, on this issue and really took up the mantle, but, mm -hmm. but the county mm -hmm. has, has done some amazing things with regards to actually positioning resources. Mm -hmm. Share with us a little bit about where you're at in this process right now. Well, you know, I, I've had to, I've, I, had to, I have to say this, I, I had the privilege of working with Phil Cerna before this, and um, I, I can tell you in working with this, um, uh, even more uh, appreciative of, of who he is uh, as a person and his particular leadership. Uh, uh, Supervisor Cerner led a Blue Ribbon Commission uh, that he put together after the 20th anniversary child death review team presented its, 20, its, uh, its uh, uh, death review report to the Board of Supervisors. And I think that he was a recently elected supervisor, and I think that he was shocked by the fact that for 20 consecutive years we had reported that African American children died at two times the rate of all other children, any other class of children in Sacramento County. Mm -hmm. uh, and he raised the question, you know, that that's a uh, hor horrendous statistic and wanted to know what we were doing about it. Uh, and he started first uh, by trying to learn more about what was driving that. So some of the, the data that we've been able to share really is, is born of that particular e uh, effort. Uh, so really was around leadership. I would say that his colleagues on the board uh, joined him and they have been supportive of the commission. They have been supportive of the committee that came out of that as one of the recommendations. That's a bit extraordinary. Well. Ex extremely Huge. so. Huge. Mm -hmm. Extremely so. The, when in your own work, uh, you, you work with, with folks in the correctional system that serve the correctional system in California, and we talk about cycles and how we end up with these indices that, that uh, Chet has just laid out for us. From your own experience, how is it that a, a community like the ones, like the six that he's identified here in town, how is it that that community ends up in a place where, where these types of problems are, are so disproportionately pervasive? I believe it's because of the um, lack of resources, lack of outlets, lack of education. Um, Tell us what you mean by that. When I say lack of education, um, if I wasn't taught and I become a parent and, and my parents didn't have either the education or the knowledge of how to parent me and to steer me in the direction and, and show me or tell me what outlets or, or what resources are available for me, then how do I teach my child when I have one? So if no one takes time to mentor these, these families, these parents, these single parent homes, take time to step in and mentor, go back to the village. You know, it takes a village to raise a child. Go back to that inference where your neighbor used to look in on you. If you needed a cup of sugar, you can go to your neighbor's house and borrow a cup of sugar. If you needed a cup of flour, if you needed a ride to the doctor or to the store, or you know, little Johnny got sick, my car is broke down, can you go pick him up? Neighbors did that for one another. Now today, neighbors hardly even know one another's names. They barely even speak when they come out of their homes. So when you go into these neighborhoods in these communities of lower economic standings and no one is stepping in to help or guide them and they don't have the knowledge, what are they left with? What do they do? They don't know how to do no better than what they know and what they know is so limited. When we had talked prior to us getting together today and you had talked about your own challenges as a single mom. Tell us your story in terms of that. We, we've talked a bit about your son, but, but tell us how you came to the place that you are today. Whew. Well, um, you know, I grew up in a two-parent family home. Um, my parents still today will be celebrating their 50th anniversary in January. Um, and military brat, you know, my father served 32 years in the military. We grew up in San Diego, California. And so even though I had two parents, 
my dad did a lot of sea time. And when we were growing up, sea time was almost 11 months, you know, not six months. And so my mom still was kind of a single parent, still kind of head of the household, even though my, my father was still a part of our lives. He wasn't really in the home because he was out working, providing for the home. So it was two girls um, kind of sped through school, were pretty good students, graduated at um, 16 and a half from a high school very similar to Grant High School. I got, um, it was a medical magnet school, so got bused into there for the medical magnet program. Um, and it was probably about six to 10 miles from my home. Um, and graduated at 16 and a half, went away to college, you know, excited, had my whole life planned for me. And around my um, end of my, my sophomore, junior year, I became pregnant. I um, was pregnant at 18 and a half um, years old. And I'm like, you know, parents thought at that point, you know, you like really messed up. You know, what are you going to do? Came back to California, um, had my daughter, went to, started still going to school, trying to work. Um, and when I, probably right before my 21st birthday, my fiance was murdered. He was murdered to, at the hands of young men, 17 years of age. He was uh -huh. home on leave from the military, um, just came back from Yokosuka, Japan, and um, visiting some family members. And while he was there, he got shot and died, you know, pierced his, went through his arm and pierced his heart. So that was my first touch on, you know, losing someone through gun violence. Um, didn't know what to do at that point, Scott. So, you know, I joined the military. You know, I, I, now I have to provide for my, my child. You know, I have to figure out how to pick up the pieces of my life. And I lost my life for a couple of months because I, I'm, I'm young, you know, just really starting out. I have a young child and not really knowing, you know, what to do next. So I joined the military. Um, great experience, you know, growth, maturity. Um, grew through that process and, you know, ended up getting out after about six years, um, had some issues. They sent me back to school, got my bachelor's in um, community psychology and human services, and then um, went back to school again, got my master's in um, organizational development. And I was like, well, my dream was always to be a doctor. And so then I went back to school and got my doctorate in psychology and org development. Um, relocated to Fresno, California. Um, did some business development, bringing companies into um, the county. And then ended up working for CCPOA is where I started in Fresno. And wanted some change, wanted to give my son a new environment, my daughter a new environment, and I decided, well, let's go to the Capitol. So we have a headquarters office here, and um, in 2009, we re relocated here to Sacramento um, and have been here since. And thank you for sharing your story. Uh, Chet, the, one of the reasons that um, I, I wanted Dr. Clavo to share a story is, is that there's a, there's a notion that education by itself and moving yourself up is, you know, sort of this protective barrier that shields you and your loved ones from all of these issues. Mm -hmm. But that's, that may be somewhat true, but that's not always the case, is it? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, education has, you know, some pretty profound protective effects for folks. You know, it's, you know, I think when I listen to your story, it's really around development and investment in, young, in a young mm -hmm. person. Uh, in this case, you know, through the military and other devices who helped you kind of find your path, re, re, you know, reclaim your path and be able to develop. And I think that's what we're thinking about in many respects as we have moved to uh, involve and, and move our initiative forward uh, in the communities uh, that are suffering these disproportionate you know, levels of child mortality. Um, and that, you know, there is, you know, there is, there are good stories that come out of that investment. Mm -hmm. You know, that people are able to change their lives. For sleep-related deaths, we think that parents who know that you, you know, you sleep a child alone on their back in their crib, right, can actually cut the African-American death rate. If we can solve that one issue, you can cut the African-American 
child mortality rate in those six communities by 50%. Yeah. Right? That's, that's quite moving the needle. Yeah, that, that's, that's moving the needle and, and really you know, quite doable. And there are two things I think that I want to just say about, just stay on that one issue at this particular point in time about this notion of being targeted and universal, um, moving the needle, and what it means to have a community be all in on, on an effort. Uh, first, I'd say that you know the city has also joined the county on this, and the city voted unanimously to be part of this particular effort, finding value in the work that we were doing. It's about data. It's about being focused. This isn't some soft you know issue. We're going to spend some money and hope for the best. We're very serious about and planful about how we plan to go about this. And then our friends who sit on the committee, um, uh, who represent you know Kaiser and Dignity, uh, have decided that they can be helpful around this issue around sleep and data death. So. Now, every child born in this region in either a Kaiser or Dignity Hospital, uh, every parent gets a safe sleep, uh, child sleep uh, assessment. And if they don't have a safe place for the child to sleep, or if they're not well informed about how to do that safely, you know, some of it's cultural, keep that child in the bed mm -hmm. and bond and, and mm -hmm. keep them close to you. And we know that that can relate and it can, it can uh, end up in unfortunate things happening. That those parents will actually leave that hospital uh, with a free crib, with a, with a safe sleeping environment. You know, we'll cover 70% of all births in this particular region, and that's a first important step to try to address this particular issue. So we start out with a focus on African-American children. We start out with a focus in six communities. We come together as a community. We call on our partners in the healthcare sectors and others. We see this as really adding value because it calls us to be the best people that we can be, the best community we can be, and change actually begins to happen. Well, well let me ask you this. This is focused on the African American mm -hmm. community. Uh, someone watching this conversation right now might say, well, why aren't you focused on Latino kids or white kids or Chinese kids? This focus on African Americans, it should be for everybody. How do you respond to that? Well, I say two, two things. You know, people like for us to be driven by data and information, not just our own sensibilities. And we've actually gone where the data has actually led us. Um, 20 years of dying at twice the rate of other children. And in some of the communities that we're investing in, it's actually three times the rate of other children. So, you know, this isn't just because, you know, we're black and we had some black agenda. This is, uh, uh, this is a public health intervention for a community that's really in crisis and losing children. The second thing I would say is the intervention that I talked about in terms of the safe sleeping assessments, that's not just for, for African American parents, that's for all parents, right? Good child policy is good child policy for all children. For everybody. It's okay. good for everybody. So you can start with that focus because we know that there's a disparity, disproportionality there. But I think if you take the approach the committee has actually taken, I think what you'll see come out of this work um, is a better policy and practice environment that's really good for all children growing up in challenging situations. Tell me, tell us this, how with this initiative will things be better five years from now? Mm -hmm. You know, we have a goal of reducing uh, the rates by 10 to 20 percent over a five-year period. We think communities will be better engaged, parents will be better informed, we think institutions that serve those communities will be better organized and coordinated. And by virtue of, of that activity, you will see lower rates uh, in those communities across those four areas, including violence, because we're actually talking about how do we deal with some of our older youth and you know the likelihood that they'll be engaged in activity that can lead to one losing one of their life. And Dr. Clavo, that's where I want to come to you. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give as a mother, as a, a professional who has a background in psychology, what advice do you give to young mothers that are raising their own JJs in order to keep them safe? I think one of the things I would, I would say first is be a parent first not a friend. Friendship comes way down the line. Um, and I think the other things I would advise parents is to really know your child. You know, children, and you and I kind of discussed this, children have no privacy. 
they they don't own it. It's a you know they don't deserve it. It's not something they should have. Um, you need to know where they are, who they associate with, what they're doing, when they're doing it, and who they're doing it with. As well as you know, I believe when it comes to your home, you need to know what's in your child's room. You need to know what it is under their mattress, you know, under their dresser, under their television, in their sock drawers, in their pillowcases. You need to know, you have every right to go in that room and know what he or she is bringing in and out of that, that room. If they come home with money and they don't have a job, you need to question that. And we're gonna have to leave it there. Thank you both. And I wish both of you well in your efforts. Thank you. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.